It is our big story. The Illini taking down Michigan State. They got it done without Kofi Coburn, without Andre Curbelo. As Andy said, Trent Frazier was the star. 16 points, five assists, and unmeasurable heart. Got it done in the post. Benjamin Bossman's Verdonk and Omar Payne combining for 15 points. And how about the freshman Luke Goody coming off the bench to nail three three-pointers, nine points in 27 minutes, both career highs. Far from a perfect performance, Brad Underwood called it a culture win. And I think it's fair to say that's what it was. Yeah, there's no question about it. Uh, this was the kind of win that they got basically through their defense, um, through the combination of experience with Trent Frazier uh, and, and then the freshman, Ver, uh, Verdunk and, and, and Goody, as you said there, uh, coming up in big moments. But I, I just think we have to just acknowledge, and after the game, Trent Frazier in the post, they gave him the game, game ball, and you saw how much he appreciated being at the University of Illinois. And look, people can take shots all they want at the NCAA membership and rules and all that, but this has been, I think, one of the best things I've seen since I've been covering college sports, that they said, you know what? There's a pandemic. You want to come back? Come back. And players like Trent Frazier have taken the most of every second of it. Uh, think about, we talk about if Kofi Coburn didn't come back, what if Trent Frazier couldn't come back? Yeah. This team would be nowhere near where it is now. No, I mean, as I said, he plays with unbelievable heart and really carried that team at times, I thought, yesterday, again, in the absence of Kofi Coburn and Andre Corbello. And we sat here yesterday and talked about what a different team they were in the Maryland game without Kofi, and, and they were a different team in the Maryland game without Kofi. But give a lot of credit to Bossman's Verdonk and Omar Payne because I thought those guys gave them at least somewhat of a post presence there yesterday, and they absolutely needed it. You can't beat Michigan State without some sort of a, a low post presence. I, I did think they had a lot of, of toughness. Again, you know, both teams struggled at times on the offensive end, Michigan State in particular. We'll get to them in, in a minute. But, but again, this was one of those performances where a lot of guys who don't normally play major roles for Illinois had to. And, and again, that goes back to that culture win and, and delivering in that way. Well, early in the season, it was a lot of talk of Coleman Hawkins. And really, Payne has come on. I mean, he was a bit of an enforcer, obviously, at Florida. And, and Bosman Verdonk has certainly stepped into this role. He has blossomed into this and taken advantage of opportunities that have been in front of him. Um, defense was sort of the architect of this win, a great crowd as well. Uh, and, and with Frazier, I just want to circle back one thing on him. He's had to play so many different roles in his five years at Illinois. When he got there, expected to do a little more. Then Io comes, takes a little bit of a step back, plays a little bit of the, you know, Robin to Batman. Uh, then he leaves, Io leaves, and then it looks like it's going to be the Curbelo show. Curbelo gets hurt. Frazier steps up. Curbelo comes back, and it's more Curbelo against Purdue. He's heard again, or now protocols, and here's Frazier. He just always is ready when called upon. And willing, willing yes. to do that, right? I, and we have talked about this, I think you and I, we've certainly talked about this on, on our shows. I mean, he was the best player on a bad team his freshman year. He's the, you know, the, the guy they went to, their go-to scorer. And if you play that role early on where you expect stuff to be run for you and for you to be the focal point, I do think it's hard to take that step back mentally. Everyone wants to win. But I think a lot of guys want to be the star as well. Yes. And he was the star early on there. So give him a ton of credit. I agree with you 100%. And, and for him to come back this year and to play the role that he's played, I think it's really impressive. But I'm with you, too. I mean, you mentioned the crowd was great. They now have seven AP top 10 wins in the last two years. Only Baylor has more. You see what a difficult home court that can be. And to overcome not having Kofi, to overcome playing a really poor game, Last time out, frankly, they did not compete great against Maryland. And to come back and play, again, not a perfect game, far from a perfect game, but to beat a top 10 team, that says something. Well, and also put in context where they were. They didn't expect to lose to, the Mar to Maryland, but had they lost last night, that would have been three in a row. Yeah. And yep. then it starts to steamroll a little because in this league, as we know, it's unforgiving. There are no off nights from one through 14. And if now you're on a three-game slide, maybe first place is out of the way. Seeding, you know, all these things are affected, gets in your psyche. So to stop it cold with that win last night and to hold on, and we can talk about how they won it at the end, you know, as well. Yeah, nearly lost it. Again, uh, Michigan State got to the free throw line. Malik Hall at the end had a chance to tie the game and send it into overtime. They've been down 
by 14 points. They rallied and, and had a great shot there to, to send it into the extra session. Second time this year they've been at the free throw line with a chance to send a game into overtime and lost both their Big Ten games, Northwestern and Illinois, that they have lost. Michigan State did not play well. I mean, they had a lot of open looks. They were 3 of 14 from 3. Illinois had a lot to do with that. So did Michigan State. I, you know, again, look, they're counting on guys, Max Christie in particular, who hasn't been in this role necessarily. He did not have a, a great game. Uh, point guard spot, Andy, I, I don't know what you make of it. I mean, it was obvious at the end Tom Izzo was really frustrated with Tyson Walker. It just feels like there are days where they get things right, and then you turn around, and, and then they don't get it right the next time out. I mean, the Wisconsin game, they were incredible, and it felt like point guard had been solved. And last night, I just... That Hogard was a, a non-factor, and, and Walker made some mistakes. Yeah, I mean, if I'm quoting Tom Izzo correctly, I think he said after the game that they were consistently inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's true. And, look, I couldn't read lips, but what I was thinking when Tom Izzo was challenging Tyson Walker in that second or third to last possession, and he takes that Aaron shot, to me, that was Tyson Walker at Northeastern. And we talked about this, you know, like, oh, he's finally got it. He's not that, you know, shot maker high shot taker like he was in the Colonial. Here he's the facilitator. And then he takes that shot, doesn't go in, uh, and you know, didn't look like Izzo was happy with him, whether, whether it was the play for him. But what we saw in the last couple of possessions was, okay, who is going to do this? And finally Malik Hall says, all right, I'm gonna just make something happen, and draws a foul. But that has been, on one side, the blessing of this team, that they're so balanced. On the other side, we could go down the list on Big Ten teams and say, okay, this guy's going to take the shot. This guy's going to take the shot. This guy's going to take the shot. With Michigan State, you know, is it Gabe Brown? Is it Hogard? Is it Hauser? Is it Malik Hall? Is it Christie? We never know. And last night, it looked like they didn't know who should take it. Agree, 100%. And, yeah, down the stretch, it felt like early on this year, it felt like it was going to be Gabe Brown, that he was kind of emerging into that role for whatever reason that, that hasn't happened here. I will say this, look, Michigan State's better than I thought they would be. Yes. Right, I mean, for them to kind of be in this spot, I think is a testament to what a great coach Tom Izzo is. But his best teams have had really good point guard play. I don't want to point just at that. I think it's unfair mm -hmm. to point just at that because again, at times the point guard play has been really good. But then there are times where they don't have a low post player, or Bingham disappears, or Christie has an off night, and, and it just feels like it's kind of you plug one hole and, right. and another one opens up. And, you know, again, I think most Big Ten coaches would say, cry me a river. They'd love, to right, have, right, right. they'd love to be in Izzo's situation. But if we're talking about them in terms of being a Final Four team, they have a ways to go. Can they get there? Hey, it's Tom Izzo. I mean, right. you would never say never. But... But this is one of those games where it just felt like they, they couldn't quite all get on the same page. I do want to talk about the other game last night as well. How about Maryland starting to play some good basketball here? I mean, so now this is two straight wins. Uh, the Illinois win, we mentioned it. Illinois was shorthanded, uh, got a win. But then to turn around and to go into Rutgers, which is a difficult place to play, and to beat the Scarlet Knights, who really needed a win, it feels like maybe Maryland's found something. Certainly this backcourt, when it's on, is phenomenal. So, Trey Demps, last night on our show, threw this out there, curious if your thoughts on this, that the two of them, Fats Russell and Eric Ayala, are the most talented backcourt tandem in the Big Ten. I pushed back a little. You could certainly go with Johnny Davis and Brad Davison, or, when healthy, Curbelo and Frazier. But when Russell and Ayala are playing like they did last night, combined 45 points, they're really difficult to beat. No question about it. Uh, this pointy thing was Dante uh, Scott. You know, he had 25 in the win against Illinois. I think he only had three last night. So they all, th th that's their big three. Yeah. If those three guys are on the same page, they can be good and disruptive. You know, they've got an interesting schedule. Three of their next four are at home. Uh, never say never. If they were to win these three, uh, they're all quad one wins. If they were to get all three of them, I just, I would not dismiss their ability to climb their way back, you know, into discussion as a bubble team. Um, it is still late January. They have a whole five weeks to do this. Uh, but it's plausible. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it certainly could happen. And, and Danny Manning gets a lot of credit. These guys never quit on him. They've gone through some peaks and valleys since he took over. You know, look, he's not considered to be a candidate, but I never say never. Steve Lavin, you know, yeah. back to UCLA. He was not going to be the guy. They go on a great run. He gets the job. 
And, and you would argue Manning obviously has better credentials at this point in his career than Lava did. So I would never say never, but uh, he's got them playing well. Four quad three losses is going to be a problem for them. But you're right. I mean, look, they have opportunities. They have Indiana and Michigan State coming up here at home. I mean, you start winning some of these games, and all of a sudden you have a little bit of a, a resume. And, and so we shall see. But I'm with you. Kind of the You think about 10 days ago when they had the big lead against Rutgers, and then it completely dissolved, and they just got blown out in the second half. And then you felt like last night there was a brief moment where it felt like Rutgers maybe was going to make a move right. here. And, oh, here we go again. And they didn't allow that to happen. I, I would add, I agree with you, you know, you expect a little more out of Dante Scott be, because I do think he has the chance, he has the potential to be a star for them. And we've seen him even in that uh, first Illinois game, right, where he can, he can kind of take over a game. But, man, they went to Caduce Wahab early in that game and tried to establish him. And he got a little something going. If you can get, you know, Julian Reese, some of these bigs who really haven't done much of anything and complement it with that backcourt... Maryland's got a little something. Well, let's be honest. In the preseason, they were considered a top five yeah. Big Ten team. Yeah, They've yeah. just had turmoil and inconsistencies, but the talent is there. And what we've seen, certainly last night from Fats Russell, I, I firmly believed it. I didn't get everything right on that top 20 returning players, but <laughs> uh, I still stick by that I thought he was going to be maybe the most impactful transfer on a team in the Big Ten. I uh, mean, when he, I mean, we were talking last night, he gets his shot off so quickly when he's zipping down on that break. I mean, he just comes right down and pops right up and, and buries it. He's got unbelievable speed. Yeah. Really, really fast, no doubt. And again, Danny Manning said this, and I know I've said it a couple times on air, they were 1-5 last year, and he wasn't part of that team. They were 1-5 in, in the Big Ten and, and made the NCAA tournament. So it can be done. I, I do want to talk about the flip side of this. That's disappointing for Rutgers, and it's two straight disappointing losses. And I give all the credit in the world to Minnesota, and we're going to talk to Ben Johnson here coming up, but that's a game that Rutgers probably should have won if they are an NCAA tournament team. And then you go home and take out Maryland. I mean, these are, you're letting opportunities slip through your fingers. Yeah, look, we sat here yesterday and talked about that uh, they could climb over this mountain. They had the opportunities. Um, you know, that Lafayette loss in the 300 sticks out. I mean, that's the albatross on their neck. But to dismiss that, you've got to you know, win these kind of games, the games that are in your neighborhood. And Maryland's a team in their neighborhood. And they had a chance to sweep them. They lose, and they don't look good in it. Um, offensively, they struggled uh, mightily. Um, and then defensively, obviously, they didn't guard well on the perimeter. So they've got problems. Um, I would say that their next game, Saturday at Nebraska, you know, keep saying must game, but that's a dangerous game because we keep waiting for Nebraska. Is it going to be later t uh, tomorrow against Wisconsin? But... We know they're going to beat people at some point. And if they take down Rutgers, you know, on Saturday, as an example, that's the kind of game that could really push them you know, we talk down. Well, I agree. We, we talk a lot about this in football. Uh, Coach DiNardo and I have this conversation a lot that I think there's a belief among fans that climbs should be linear, that you know, you, you take over a program, you won six games, and, and then you're going to win 10, and then you're going to win 14, and then you're going to make the tournament, and then you're going to make the tournament every year, and then you're going to, you know, sweet 16 and final four and all that. It just doesn't always work that way. I mean, sometimes you take a couple steps forward, you take a step back, and then the next year, unexpectedly, you take steps forward. It feels like maybe that's the story a little bit, unfortunately, with this Rutgers team. I want to write them off. No, no. I'd say they can't go on a, a run here, and they're going to have a ton of opportunities because – after these next two games at Nebraska, at Northwestern, they play five straight against ranked teams. So, I mean, if you win a few of those, you're back in the conversation. But they had dug such a hole that it felt like they needed to win these games against the lower level opposition. And, and they just haven't gotten it done here the last couple. No question. Two guys that I would bring up. We just mentioned one of them in Trent Frazier. The other one is Brad Davison. They stuck it out for that super senior year. Um, the two guys that left Rutgers that would make a significant difference had they stayed. And that, I have no issue that they left. They did their own thing. Right. But you watch them in the last two weeks in the Pac-12, Miles Johnson has been a significant contributor for UCLA, and Jacob Young absolutely torched UCLA with 23 for Oregon. Now, his older brother played at Oregon, so there was a connection, obviously, for him to go back west. But, you know, those two guys on this same Rutgers team, Completely different story. No doubt. And that's the challenge of yes. coaching in this day and age because you have a historic feel-good year 
where you guys are the kings of the campus and yet guys still leave. And, and again, I'm with you. You don't hold it against them. Right. But, but you don't expect it yes. as, as a coach after a, a and season. And you can't like replace it late in the year. Not necessarily. Yeah. Right? They, they were not able to do as well in the portal right. in terms of, you know, Andre Hyde has not been right. nearly the contributor that, that Jacob Young was, to, to say the least. Uh, anyway, lots more to, to talk about. Uh, we're going to continue here with Andy. Coming up next, we'll hand out some midseason awards, get a player of the year discussion, a coach of the year, who Andy likes on those, and hard not to like what Ben Johnson has done at Minnesota. The Gophers coach going to join us after an unlikely win. Stick around. I feel like anytime I step on the court, I'm the best player, but that's just another mindset that I have. I have a job to do, and I know I can get it done. I can't even believe in myself that I'm playing this well and leading this team to, you know, being one of the top teams in the nation right now. An all-new episode of The Journey, Big Ten Basketball 2022, fueled by Gatorade tonight, 5.30 Eastern on the Big Ten Network. Well, I certainly hope you were watching yesterday. Megan McEwen was here. We were handing out some mid-season awards for the women. We're going to do the same for the men today. Uh, let's start here. Coach of the year. Where are you going? All right. So um, a couple weeks ago, I did my national coaches of the year and certainly had Ben Johnson, who we'll hear from shortly, uh, in my top three or four at the time. That's when they were considered a tournament team. They had one loss. But since then... I feel like you have to go with Greg Gard. They were picked in the bottom third of the Big Ten. They've already amassed probably more, probably the best resume in the Big Ten uh, when you look at the data. Uh, the win at Purdue, um, you know, go back to that win over Houston, a healthy Houston in Las Vegas. Uh, there's no question. I know they lost the other night to Michigan State, but you're going to take on a couple losses. Uh, I think that he has done arguably his best coaching job in his career. Agree with you wholeheartedly. And by the way, that's a high bar because he's had a really yes. good career, including the first year where he was handed some difficult circumstances and, and managed to get that team into the tournament and, and hang on to the job on a permanent basis. But I, I agree with you. I think if the question is, who is the coach of the year to this point, I think it's hard to argue that it's not him. I and mean, they were picked 10th in the league right. in the preseason media poll. I do think that if Minnesota manages to make the NCAA tournament, then you'd have a strong case for yes. Mike Johnson because they were picked to finish last in the league by essentially everyone. I mean, I, again, I've said a few times, I wouldn't have been shocked at the beginning of the year had they not won a game in the Big Ten. So they have far exceeded my expectations. And I will say this. I think Greg will get some national recognition as well. I mean, he should be, if you win the Big Ten Coach of the Year, you should be in the top five nationally. Big Ten Player of the Year. I think there's no lack of candidates here. This one is really hard. So um, I think it's harder, and we can get to this, to the first team. But in terms of Player of the Year, I still go with Johnny Davis uh, because of he's had more Player of the Year moments uh, within the conference. Uh, if we want to throw in Houston as well. Um, they're off to the Big 12, not the Big Ten. Um, and, uh, but the 37 against Purdue. I mean, that was, to me, a player of the year moment. As talented and, you know, as Kofi Coburn is, he's not obviously played every game. Uh, Keegan Murray missed the first Purdue game. Uh, he was hurt. And, uh, you know, he hasn't had as big a game in a couple of the games, for example, the Wisconsin game. Uh, so I think that hurts his candidacy. And, you know, Trace Jackson Davis, they've been a little inconsistent. So uh, I go back to... Um, I, I try to remember who you quoted about about you know winning matters, and you know yeah. and, and, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Jackson. Yes, the victory goes the spoils. Yes. yes, and so problem with EJ Liddell as well. I mean, he would be in this conversation, but and I know they beat Wisconsin, but overall, I would give the nod to Johnny Davis. I think you've isolated the guys that I would think about. I, I think for whatever reason, somehow EJ Liddell gets slightly overlooked. I know. I, I I mean, I think he is unbelievable, and and we talked about players who have evolved their games kind of in the Trent Frazier discussion and evolved their role. I mean, E.J. Liddell has just gotten better and better. He has addressed what might have been perceived as weaknesses in his game. So I, I think he is every bit in that conversation. But I agree with you. I think it's tough to argue with Giant Davis. I think it's really hard. But if it's up to this point in the year, again, I, I think it's him. I still think that if Illinois goes on some great run and Kofi comes back hopefully healthy, I certainly think he's going to be in that conversation 
I think it's going to be tough for Keegan Murray just because Iowa feels like they're going to finish somewhere in the middle. Yes. Right? And and so that's kind of back you to You would that. have to be so dominant. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if, if that were the case. I mean, on the women's side, you know, Caitlin Clark, to me, she's won it already, you know, conference and national. And e- even if Iowa, you know, were to finish fourth or fifth in the Big Ten. Right, if you're just supremely yes. great. But, I mean, 17 but, assists last night. <laughs> unbelievable. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what about defensive player of the year? Where are you going there? So I struggled with this, and I think this is wide open because you could go with a perimeter defender, and Caleb McConnell is one of the better uh, in the, the league and in the country in steals, um, or you go the rim protection and rebounding. Uh, you know, Do you go with Kofi Coburn, who alters and intimidates more shots uh, than anyone else. Do you go with Zach Eady? Same deal. Um, E.J. Liddell, very good rebounder. Um, so, you know, in this moment in time, I might go with Kofi. Uh, you know, he he's looming over here. He's, he's got a rim in his hands. So Just gotta... because the stats may not show it, but what he does when he's on the floor in terms of just the overall intimidation and altering shots that don't even get taken... I think you have to factor that in. Alters the game. Yes. Right. I, I would put Tyler Wall in that conversation, too. You didn't mention him. We're, we're getting with Scott's yes. heavy. But but I do think he's he's had a really good year defensively. And I, just talking to opposing coaches and getting a sense of why he really changes the game. Freshman of the year, this is not a great year for freshmen. No. Frankly. Do you think it's Max Christie just kind of by default here? Yes, although he had another – he had a poor game Yeah, he did not play night. well. No, um, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, it's not like it's been every game. What happens if Bryce McGowan's and Nebraska start winning some games? You know, does he end up getting it? What about Caleb Houston? Um, what if he starts playing yeah, really well? I mean, because he has last He is games. the most, or he's certainly the highest touted freshman. Yeah. Uh, and we don't even talk about him. So, yeah, if Michigan has a great run in the latter part. So this is an award um, that is far from decided. I mean, th- this really could change over the next month. Right. And again, we're saying to this point in the year. Yes. And I think it's almost inarguable given how many Big Ten Freshman of the Week awards he's won. He's yes. been the best guy to this point, whether or not he ends up winning it or not. You, you touched on this, and I think this is fascinating. You've been talking about this since December, how hard this is going to be. And I, I'm an All-Big Ten voter to have to pick five guys for first-team All-Big Ten in a year where I think you could make an argument there are eight or nine who in most years would make it. So here's the deal with all Big Ten. We have some definitive players. Johnny Davis, no question he's on it. Yes. Keegan Murray, no question he's on it. I think Kofi Coburn has to be on it, okay? Yeah. So now I got three. I would say in this moment in time, I go with Trace Jackson Davis, all right? This is where I struggle because I want to put E.J. Liddell, but I feel like how can I not have someone from Purdue? And then if I have someone from Purdue, who do I pick? Do you go Ivy? Do you go Edie? Do you go Travion Williams? So there's a part of me that says, do they all cancel each other out? And do we go with Liddell and put him there, who's deserving? Um, that, to me, is going to be the hardest decision for everyone yeah, who decides. I mean, I think E.J. Liddell is a first-team all-conference player. Who am I moving off that list? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, they're, they're all awfully good. Yes. But, I, I, I mean, he is a phenomenal player. Yes. And, again, I, I think he's very much in the discussion for Big Ten Player of the Year. So, to say he's not first team all Big Ten. So, who would you move on? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Can, can we show it again? Oh, there it is. Um, man. I, I don't know. I mean, I hate to say Jaden Ivey because he's a lottery pick. Right. Um, but, but part of the issue with Purdue is they have three great players. Right. So how do you decide on him and not Zach Eady, Eady or not Travion Williams? But I don't know. I mean, this is going to be really, really hard. Um, you know what you, Maybe Trace Jackson Davis. But, but again, I mean, he's, he's an All-American candidate. He's right. having a fabulous year. He's, he's one of the top players. He was in better league. in that game against Ohio State. He was. Yeah. No, it's really hard. And then... You know, I still think, like, none of the Minnesota guys are. Like, Jameson Battle's having a great year, right? right? I mean, Peyton Willis, Peyton Willis having a really good year. There but I, moments I, when Ron Harper deserved it. No doubt. And I, I think that is where you're kind of looking at this being one of those years where What players, if Fats Russell continues what he's doing? <laughs> where players who ordinarily would be on it. Yes. You turn in the kind of season that these guys are having. You're like, well, he's first-team all-big-team player. And 
And it just may not happen because you have, again, I'll say it again, that Ken Palm, his, his top players, his player of the year, you got four of the top seven in the country right. in one league. So it's hard. There are going to be some hurt feelings. Yes. And you could just have a second team that's all Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you could just say second team, Purdue. Yes. Uh, unlikely story of the year, that has got to be Minnesota, right? Ben Johnson doing a masterful job his first year at the helm. We're going to talk to the Gophers coach coming up next. Part of a banner week for Gopher Athletics, one that included Peyton Willis being named Big Ten Co-Player of the Week after scoring 32 points and tying a school record with eight made threes in the Gophers' home win over Rutgers Saturday, a game they won despite being without three of their top four scorers and having just seven available scholarship players. Which gets us to our big interview. Gophers head coach Ben Johnson is joining us. Coach, I believe you are the first coach ever to be on this show multiple times so we'll we'll <laughs> dig into the archives we'll fact check that and make sure but but really appreciate it have been looking forward to talking to you here for a couple days that was an amazing performance on saturday what are you proudest of i, I appreciate it and uh it's always good to good to be on um probably proudest of just the way our guys handled the the whole situation um just their their maturity level um you know they didn't they didn't really bat an eye um you know they stepped up to the challenge uh, they were connected they played as a total team um but they didn't try to make excuses and they know that you know that's what we try to pride ourselves on here is is regardless of the circumstance um you got to put your best foot forward you got to try to find a way to to power through and and, and be successful one of the things that really stood out to me from the pregame interview, we were doing the pregame in the studio, and, and you said essentially that, that we're not going to make any excuses. We've got going to play the hand that we've been dealt here. How do you convey that to your guys? I mean, I know you can say it in words, but how do you convey it beyond words? That, hey, we're, gonna, we're just going to play it out with, with whomever we've got. What's the, how do you instill that mindset maybe is the best question. Yeah, I think we, we've tried to do that from day one, you know. Um, we knew this year could potentially be, be a little challenging and that we were going to be facing some obstacles from, from day one. And so that's been something that we've prided ourselves on since our guys got to campus. And so the message uh, hasn't really changed. And I think because of that, you know, our guys kind of have embodied, you know, that this is who we are. This is, this is what we are about. And, um, you know, it, it was nothing new. And so uh, the belief that, that I have in those guys, the belief that my staff has in them, I think they feel that, they understand that, and I think that's, uh, that's translated to them believing in, in each other, you know. And, and we talk about having kind of that irrational confidence, and I want these guys to have that. And, um, you know, I think they do, and I think that, that helped us carry uh, and push through for a big win for our program. You also mentioned in that pregame interview that there was going to be a lot on Peyton Willis's shoulders and that you told him, I don't care if you miss your first 10 shots, you need to take number 11 and take number 12. He did not miss his first 10 shots, as you well know. Where does that performance rank among the best ones you've seen, given the circumstance, given that he personally had to have a big game for you to have a shot? Yeah, it's right at the top. Um, I mean, his ability to not only perform, but to lead and to do it the right way. You know, I thought he took shots in the flow of the game. Uh, he still was able to facilitate and get his teammates involved. Um, but for me, the thing I'm, I'm most proud of is his leadership. You know, during timeouts, you know, head was never down, uh, was constantly talking. He knew he had to rally the troops. He knew that, you know, our guys were all going to look to him um, and see where his confidence was at, see where his head was at. And he did a great job leading. And, and we don't obviously win that game or get even close um, if he doesn't bring his effort both mentally and physically. And so for him to do that um, against a really good defensive Rutgers team, um, and like you said, he kind of threw the perfect game. Um, and that's what we needed. And, and, you know, his number was called. He rang the bell. So couldn't be more proud of, of his effort. Um, a kid that just works relentlessly every single day. Um, you know, you always like to see kids like that get rewarded. It does feel like culture is one of those overused terms. And yet it does apply sometimes. Brad Underwood talked about last night, Illinois. That was a culture win for them without two of their key players. This felt like a culture win for you. And I guess more broadly, what do you want the identity of this program to be? This is an unusual year, as you've acknowledged, 
just given the number of transfers and the circumstances in which you took over. But ultimately, what do you want Minnesota basketball under Ben Johnson to be known for? No, that's a great question. Um, you know, something we, we try to talk about within our walls a lot. Um, you know, we're a, we're a development, toughness, and team program. And um, I think we've seen that kind of take center stage this year. I think our guys have worked, uh, and all the credit goes to them, to get better individually and to help our team get better. And we try to learn from every game, whether we win or lose, and, and develop, uh, you know, better so that we're able to, to be in position uh, to win close games, to win games where maybe we have a lead and it gets dicey. Um, and then I think the, the toughness piece, you know, that's always got to be a constant. We got to be the most physical, uh, tough team. We got to be mentally tough. And then we got to be a team. You know, we got to be a connected group if we're going to if we're going to push through. And, and that's got to be a staple for who we are and, and kind of our brand in this league. Um, you know, we play in the best league in the country and we have unbelievable coaches um, and, and we need to have that identity of, uh, you know, never say die type attitude and, and kind of be the, the bully on the block. Um, and I think in this league, just being here as a player, as an assistant, now as a head coach, it hasn't changed much. Um, you know, I think it's, it's pretty blue collar, nuts and bolts, and, and we got to make sure we embrace that and we bring it every day. Where are you guys health wise right now, coach? Pretty good. You know, um, we're still day to day. I think I think <laughs> a lot of teams would, would probably say that right now. You're still you're still day to day. Um, you know, hopefully we're we're on the upward trajectory of, of getting fully healthy. Um, but, you know, we'll see what what today brings. I know our guys are are doing everything possible, um, you know, whether they're injured or a little bit banged up or battling uh, this or that. Um, you know, they're doing everything they can to get back on the court. But we understand, you know, it, like I said, during during these times, especially this year, this is kind of the way the the, the, the ball is bounced and, and you've got to be able to, to put your best foot forward with whoever you got that day. And, and we'll continue to do that. Where is Eric Curry in particular in his battle to get back on the court? Derek's doing really good. He had a really good day yesterday. Um, you know, he, he's itching to get out there. He's itching to get on the practice court. He's itching to, to play in a game. Um, you know, I don't think anybody wants to be out there battling with his, with his teammates more than, more than Eric. You know, as a senior, knowing that, uh, you know, each day goes by is, is one less day you have to be part of, part of the program. I know it, it eats at him. Um, but we're going to make sure that, you know, Eric's, you know, close to 100% when he goes out there. We want to make sure that uh, we have him for the long run. We're not going to ever put, you know, his health uh, in jeopardy. Um, but at the same time, He's a big piece of what we do. So you know, hopefully he has the next couple of good days and we can see what it looks like uh, tomorrow. And then we'll, uh, we'll go forward from there. We were talking in studio on Saturday that maybe one of the byproducts of this game would be that you would get some more confidence in some of those players on your bench because you'd be forced to put them in these situations. We talked a lot about you're getting the fewest bench minutes of any team in the country. And again, a lot of that is out of necessity. But one guy who has stood out here recently is Trayton Thompson. I thought he really stepped up in that game Saturday. Do you now find yourself in a situation where you think he can help you contribute even when you are back at full strength? Yeah, I think I think Trey's done a great job, um, especially these last couple of days. But, you know, bigger than that, the last about month, uh, month and a half, he's done a great job of, of putting the work in, you know, and, and like I said, credit goes to him. Um, you know, he knew, like all freshmen, if you look across the country and and especially in our league, it is hard for a true freshman to, to earn minutes. Um, it's just so tough. And, and the, the gap between high school and, and, you know, power five, big 10 basketball, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. And, and he's had the patience with that. And he's known that, you know, I have to gain trust from, you know, not only himself, uh, and, and trusting his work and trusting his ability, but his teammates and his staff, like all young guys do. Uh, but he's put in the time, and he's got better through practice, and now he's ready. And I think that's a testament to him. He didn't pout. Um, he came to work every day. He put in extra work, and you're seeing it pay dividends. And I think um, the confidence that he has right now will definitely help you know, our program going forward. Um, you know, we're hoping he can continue to just bring that energy, bring that passion that he does, because um, he's a unique player. You know, at a true seven feet, He's not your traditional back to the basket five. You know, he's a he's really a mobile kind of stretch four. And so, you know, offensively, he poses a lot of challenges for for a defense. Um, but then, you know, conversely, we've got to find unique ways right now um, on the defensive end to to get matchups that are in his favor. You know, you always want to put kids in a position where where they can be successful. Um, but you know, he's proven uh, through work ethic and and through his you know competitive spirit. 
um, that he's going to help this program and help this team moving forward. So couldn't be more excited for him. Um, and it's just, again, it's a testament to when you do the right thing and you work and you just kind of put your head down and you don't you know, worry about the outside noise, uh, good things can happen. Coach, one of the things that's really stood out is how seamlessly you have transitioned to being a head coach first time. You've done it, obviously. Who have you leaned on for advice when you face a circumstance or a situation that is one you're facing for the first time? You know, a lot of people. I've been I've been extremely fortunate um, in my career. You know, I've worked for some great, great coaches, great you know, mentors, um, guys that have done it the right way. Whether it's you know Ben Jacobson at Northern Iowa, uh, Tim Miles now at San Jose State, Travis Steele at Xavier. Um, you know, guys within the league. You know, I've, I've stated before, Coach Izzo's been great to me. Um, you know, those guys have really uh, instilled confidence that, you know, they, they, they've been where I've been. They've been first-year coaches. Um, but they've also prepared me. You know, guys that I've worked for, you know, have given me a, a big leash, and, and they've let me grow as a coach, and, and I couldn't be more thankful for that. Uh, so I know, you know, success is, is a team effort. You know, my staff here also does a great job. Um, but, you know, to be able to have, you know, mentors that I've worked for, guys that I can call, at any time that I know are going to give me, you know, great advice and they're going to lead me down the right path. Uh, couldn't be more thankful for that. You got Ohio State coming into the barn tomorrow. What are the biggest keys in that matchup? You know, Ohio State, uh, you know, I think Chris Holtzman is one of the best, best coaches in the country. Um, I just think he does a phenomenal job with how he runs his program. Um, you know, they're just, they're rock solid. You know, top to bottom, guys that come off the bench, everybody has a role. Everybody understands their role. Um, they're great defensively. And they got a big time player in EJ Liddell, who, who opposed, you know, a ton of challenges uh, for a defense. So, you know, we're going to have to put our best foot forward. We're, we're, we're going to have to be locked into the scouting report. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of room for error in this game. You know, we got to be able to take from Indiana, from Michigan State, from Rutgers, from Iowa. Uh, we've got to take every lesson we've learned from there and apply it on Thursday if we want to give ourselves a chance to win. It's going to be a kind of a, a back down brawl. You know, those guys, uh, like I said, they, they play with max effort. They've got a lot of experience, and, and we're going to have to play really, really well if we want a chance to, uh, to be in position to win. Ben Johnson, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for taking the time out to speak with us again here on Big Ten today. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. 